I invite you to turn with me in your Burgundy Bibles to page 685. 685, which is Isaiah 7. As I was preparing for this homily, putting in my 60 hours, that was a joke, but as I was preparing for this, as I was looking at the first lesson, which is what most of this homily is about, plus a bit of the gospel, one of the things that I found challenging was trying to understand it from what's given us in our missalettes. It's a little bit confusing because as you're reading this from the, the missalette, what our reading is today, it's so short, and it, it just, uh, we don't know what's going on. God is asking, God tells through Isaiah, Ahaz, the king of Judah, ask for a sign, whether all the way down in the netherworld or all the way up into the heavens, ask for a sign, and I'll give you whatever you want to prove to you what I'm going to do but we don't know what he's promised to do. So what we're going to do, to do with this in order to understand just exactly what's going on in this Old Testament lesson is to look at it in its context with the rest of Isaiah chapter 7. So I'll probably be adding about half an hour to my homily today to, to explain that. No, I'm not going to do that to you. However, let's look at this from uh, chap page 685 and this is the context in which we are studying this and looking at this. The king of Judah, which is where Jerusalem is, that country, his name is Ahaz. And Ahaz is very afraid of two kings that want to overcome his country and take over. One of the kings is from a country called Syria, which is where Damascus, Syria is, is still there today. And the other country is Israel. Because Israel is no longer just Judah and Jerusalem and all this, but it's a country that's been split in two. The northern area is now called Israel, and the southern kingdom is where the king of Judah is. And uh, what happens and historically is that the northern kingdom eventually disappears. You ever heard of the lost tribes of Israel? That's them. Why are they lost? Because they disappeared. So they're no longer in history. So the southern kingdom is what you have called present Israel today. So he's afraid of these two kings, and he's trying to figure out what they're going to do because these countries could over overwhelm them very easily. So if you look with this in understanding, look at chapter 7, verse 3, page 685. It says, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son Shear Jashub. Uh, his kids, uh, the other kids made a lot of fun of his name in school. Uh, to, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. That's in Jerusalem, where, the, where Ahaz rules as king of Judah. Then skip down now to verse 4, and it says, Say to him, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. He's talking about those two kingdoms. Now jump down to verse 7. Yet this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. Next page. And then it goes on in explaining what's going to happen instead, that these countries are going to fall apart. He says, don't be afraid. He's already promised what he's going to do is to protect these people. The Judah, Judah the country of Judah, is going to protect the king. Now, look down to verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heavens, but Ahaz says, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Do you know why he's not going to put the Lord to the test? It sounds like he's being real religious. Oh, I would never put God to the test. I'm not going to challenge him. He'll do what he wants. No, that's not why he said that. The real, in fact, what he's doing is he's just being sanctimonious. Kind of like you and me when we say God wants me to go to Disney World. Right? 
The Lord told me in a dream, I need to go on vacation. That, you know, we're just justifying ourselves like he's doing. But the real reason he's saying this is because he has already taken matters into his own hands and decided not to trust the Lord. He's going to the country of Assyria to get help. So when God says this, he says, so, you know, ask for a sign. He says, I don't need one. I've got God. I got it all taken care of. I got it all dialed in. I'm going to take care of myself without having to trust you. He doesn't trust the Lord. So then God says this about this this uh, sign. Now look at this. This is very interesting. If it says down here in uh, verse 11, ask for a sign, and he says, I won't ask for a sign. And then in verse 14, this is the sign. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. God with us. That's what is translated in Hebrew. Here's the problem, folks. This occurred in the 8th century B.C. How can Jesus being born in the 1st century A.D., seven centuries later, be a sign for something that's already taken place? Do you catch what I'm saying? This prophecy or this sign doesn't help Ahaz. What's happening here? This is it. There's two Emmanuels. There's an Emmanuel in the 8th century, and then there's the Emmanuel, which is Jesus Christ. Look at verse 16. For before the boy, that's Emmanuel that's going to come, the virgin will conceive, before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. In six or seven years, this is not going to be a problem, Ahaz. Stop worrying because this child, this Emmanuel in the 8th century is going to be a sign of when it's going to come to an end. Now, here's the problem with that, though. Does that mean there were two virgin births? Right? The virgin will conceive? This is it. This is really funny. If you look at this Bible in the Hebrew... The original, the original version that this was written in, it doesn't say virgin. The word it uses is alma, which means young woman. So in the 8th century, a young woman had a child named him Emmanuel, and all this took place, but it's pointing to something greater to happen with the birth of Jesus. Then why does it say virgin here? You ever wonder that? Why is it saying virgin if it wasn't a virgin? In the second century, there was a new translation of the original Hebrew. And it took the word for, for young woman, Alma, and translated it to Parthenos, which means virgin. Second century, two centuries before the birth of Jesus. So we're going, well, why why'd they do that? God knows. But it became the Christian Bible. In the early church, they used a Greek Bible that said virgin. And so that's why we have this in here today. And here's what I'm trying to say with this. This is why Joseph had such a hard time with Mary in Matthew today. Did you catch that? Joseph came and he saw Mary and he looked at her and he said, Whoa! My Alma, this young woman, is pregnant. And he thought he was being, she'd been unfaithful to him. And so he has this dream, and God says to him, this is not an Alma, she's not just a young woman, she's a virgin, a Parthenos, which is a very special relationship because she's born, he's going to give birth to the Son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit. This is why it matters. This morning, when you worship Christ and when you think of Jesus and the birds and birds, you think of Christmas, God coming, do you think of Jesus just as an Elma, born of a young woman? Or do you think of it as a Parthenos, virgin birth, God himself becoming one of us? 
I think a lot of us really, we have trouble connecting with Jesus. We've been doing the religious thing all our lives. You go to church, yeah, we do the Christmas thing, open the presents and so forth. But Jesus, is Jesus real to you? Is he somebody who is God with us? Is God truly with you, flesh and blood? Or is he just an historical figure, the son of an Alma? That's the challenge. That's why Jesus told the Jews, he said, most of you aren't going to make it. Because I never knew you. I never experienced you. Jesus says, comes to us today and he says, I am coming special, not just to be with you and be, get your back and support you. I am coming to become one with you. When you take the Eucharist today, Jesus, the Son of God, the, the, the Son of a Parthenos, Son of a Virgin, will come to you. And it's not just a human being. It's not just an historical figure. It's not just a tradition. It is God himself coming to dwell within you. Let me read something to you. Oh, please, Father, don't. This is from Nicholas Cabasilas, an Eastern Christian writer. Listen to what he says about this special connection of this Jesus the son of the virgin. The things of Christ, however, are ours more than our very selves. They belong to us because we have become his members, his sons, and share flesh and blood and spirit with him. They are closer to us, not only than that which comes by training, but even closer than that which is a result of our nature, since, as has been shown, he is more akin to us than our very parents. You see, Jesus has to become an encounter with us. He has to be somebody who's flesh and blood in order to save us. When you were born, you have, you're akin to your parents. But here's how it happens. You have one cell from dad and one cell from mom. You have an egg and a sperm. They come together and they made you. Just two cells from each of them. But today, when you receive the body and blood of Christ, when you are receiving his actual physical body and blood because God became human, it's all of Jesus. All of Christ is in you, changing you. That's an encounter. It's not just a tradition. There was a, um, the, let me give an example of how this uh, helped to bring this forward for you. This is a true story. There was this, this woman who was explaining to her daughter about communion, the Eucharist, receiving the body and blood of Christ. And she told him, her, her daughter, when I come forward, I'm going to receive, it's not bread and wine, I'm going to receive all of Jesus. This is his body, and this is his blood. And when I come in, he's going to be part of me. So when she took communion, the daughter stayed in the pew next, uh, where they were seated, when she came back to sit down, her daughter prostrated in front of her because God, all of God, was in her. Paul says in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ, yet it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You have God living in you. It has to make a difference. It has to convert us. To have God come into us again and again and again through Jesus Christ has to make us different than what we are. And you know what it does for you? This is going to blow your minds. It makes you God. God became man so that man and woman might become God. That's what God's plan is for you. That's your salvation. It's not just to remember Jesus and sign on the dotted line, yeah, I took my catechism, I had this happen, I had that happen. Ultimately what it is, is that God brings you so close to him that every encounter you have in this life, in this world, is a, is a sacrament. Everything is sacrament because God became a man. That's what your calling is, is to find God. And not only that, is to find him, God in the person next to us.